People, fantastic. Uh, his inspiration to create a company uh, which which designed environmentally conscious, sorry, appropriate housing began with the design and construction of his first solar passive house in 1977. How long ago was that? <laughs> Quick. 40 like years. 40 years. <laughs> Since 1991, solar dwellings have designed hundreds of homes in WA, interstate, and even on the North Island of New Zealand. Griff is a strong believer in living his commitment, thinking globally and acting locally. A vivid demonstration of this uh, is, sorry, this, this substantial commitment of more than 33 years in both time and energy and money is to the Hunger Project. So a portion of Solid Dwelling's annual profits are invested in projects to educate and empower women in countries such as or in all over Africa, India, Bangladesh, Central and South America. Griff and other solid dwelling staff have been awarded over 60, uh, a recognised representative of those 60 uh, awards, and work on notable projects such as the creation of a 10 star rated house in Hilton, uh, built by Josh Byrne from Gardening Australia. Uh, I have a personal connection to Griff. Griff's the reason I'm standing here this evening, he doesn't know that. Uh, so, would you please welcome Griff Morris? I mean, obviously, you know, one thing they're talking about North America and Canada. I'm going to separate those two, but if they're Canadians, <laughs> they get very upset. <laughs> um, so, um, and of course, they're talking about you know, oriented houses to the south. And we're not going to do that, are we? No. So we're going to orient them to the north. Um, but look, first up, um, you've said enough about me. I'm not going to say anything more about me. So I'm interested in, first up, questions about what you saw, how it relates to you. Um, in other words, it's something you say, well, how, what would I do? Would I do a round birth home? Would I do a straw bath home? Uh, would I do a retrofit? Would I live in a little, you know, a caravan style home, etc., etc.? So, so you thought I was going to talk really to you first. So, and what I'll do from that is I'll relate it back to our situation here. See, sustainability is not what we think it is most of the time. It's not unusual homes, and it is unusual homes, but it doesn't have to be. Um, it's the way we live, the way we include um, our families, our social structure, the way we use our money, uh, the way we relate to the neighbours over the fence. Um, all of those things are about sustainability. I'm working with some developers in Victoria and they, they flew me over there for a meeting to tell them <laughs> about sustainability. I've got a terrible sense of humour by the way. So there's these people who spent a lot of money, the, the money people, there's the there's engineers, there's local government, there's you know, all these people. And I asked them to bring their partners to the meeting. And they're going, you know, they're like, hang on, we don't know to do this. Um, and so they came along and they're sitting there and they said, well, okay, could you talk to us? I said, well, I can, but I want you to talk first. And I, well, I, they said, well, you're going to tell us about sustainability. I said, yeah, but I need to know about who you are. So I said, tell me about who you are. Tell me about your family. Tell me why you're involved in that project because I want to know, you know, context, relationship. So first up, you know, bit stilted, a bit hesitant to say, but as you notice as they went through the group, more and more, they said more and more about themselves, the family and their commitment. You know, so you were building community just in that meeting. 
and building the relationship and the context for what was to come. And so at the end of it, um, um, they were ready for me, so I stood up and said, well, you don't need me, really. <laughs> <laughs> and I was brave enough to say, okay, so tell us why. And I'm saying, well, see, you're all sustainable. In other words, you're here. You know, the ones that are putting money into this, you're able to run your lives, so you've got this excess money to actually put into this large development. This is 3,000 lots, you know, um, in a part of Victoria, so it's not a small development. And um, you've got your partners here. Everybody brought their partners, you know, so which was fabulous. And so, in other words, you're healthy. You made it here. Your lives work. Obviously, your partnerships work because they're they're here with you. So therefore, you're sustainable. So I said, all you need to do is take the relationships you have with money, with your families, with the people you work with, and that, that sustainability that you developed, and you develop a new relationship with building green, let's call it, you know, because you've got all the other terms, you know, climate sensitive design, and passive solar design, environmental design, green design, um, energy efficient design, they're all sustainability. So that's what sustainability is. It's about you and about your communities. How you live, which we're talking about here, is critical. Of course, where do you spend most of your time? Well, that, I mean, most of the office, actually. But anyway, that's another story. I do live above my office. So I'm 17 steps. That's a trap. So I have 300 square metres of garden in front of the office. I grow veggies in the garden. You know, I've got probably over a dozen fruit trees and all up in Mount Hawthorne. Uh, in Green Street. <laughs> seriously, seriously. Yeah. Can't help myself. <laughs> so, but, so, you're sustainable. You're here. You know, you have homes to live in. You know, so um, that's what sustainability is about. If you look at what sustainability is about technically, it's about a sustainable home is a home that has. Um, no depletions to the environment. It doesn't take anything from the environment. So, do you think there is such a thing as a sustainable home? No, there is no such thing as a sustainable home. What happens? You have varying degrees of sustainability, as you have in your own lives. You talk to your family, you have more sustainable relationships. You go home and you don't, you don't. So, you develop a relationship with sustainability, and whatever, whatever area works for you, you know, why I walk up and down is to keep you awake. <laughs> um, and I drop the occasional very inane joke so that it opens your brain up as well. So, um, but so you can choose any part of your life to be sustainable. You can choose at work. You could choose in the way you buy your food. You could choose the way you buy your clothes. You could choose what you do with your car, you know, where you walk instead of jumping in the car and going down the street, which means management. Management is sustainability. You can't be sustainable unless you learn to manage yourself in all those different areas. You know, showers, the biggest user of, of energy in your house. Anybody tell what it is? The biggest energy other than the kids? It's helium, <laughs> helium, helium, helium cooling. No. Fridge freezer? Water. Close. Big one. Fridge freezer? Which? The fridge. Freezer? Fridge freezer. Another big one, which is very interesting, that one, but another one. Water. Um, could be if you've got a lot of kids. Mm. But, um, big one. Water use. Hot water. Hot water is the biggest user of energy. So, therefore, if you look, hot water is look, somewhere between 20 and 30% of your energy. You could change it just by going home and turning the thermostat down and save enormous amount of energy. Timing your showers. Oh, killer, right? Eh? Um, especially when you want to warm up, it's a bit chilly. So hot water is the biggest user, straight off. So therefore, to retrofit a home or considering with a new home, your hot water is critical. <coughs> After that, heating and cooling. After that, refrigeration. Heating and cooling, look, in Perth, depending on how many people the size of the home, etc., etc., it varies. But heating and cooling combined are around about 25%. Some homes, horrors, they could be more, but generally around 25%. Um, so if you look at refrigeration, refrigeration is around 17% for most homes, you know, 
I love the ones that beep if you leave it open for more than 60 mm -hmm. seconds. You can get a shower head um, that you can connect and um, it will give you, you can set it for three minutes or whatever you set it to and then it'll you know, let you know beep just before the, um, before the three minutes you've got enough to get the soap off. And then when it stops, you can't turn it back on for five minutes. <laughs> so you can't just reset it. Okay. Great system, actually. Um, so for those that have trouble training themselves, get a small device that trains you. Um, if you want to be trained, the best trainers in the room. Where are the best trainers in the room? Kids. Kids. They'll take it on more than anything else, and guess what? They'll hold you to account. <laughs> Which you know. So um, yeah, so you're the future. So hold them to account, so you have a great future. Because that's what sustainability is too. That we use things in a way that we don't um, disallow future generations to have what we have. So it is about future generations. That's what sustainability is. Um, so. Take some questions. Talk about houses, didn't we? Yeah. We'll take some questions. We'll take some questions. Yes, questions. Okay. So, so after all that, that's what anyone thinking of buying now, a house? Ask about houses. I mean, yeah. all of those I can relate. I've done lots of straw bale homes, two-story straw bale home, which is open on Sunday. I'll, I'll pass these out. Um, there's sustainable house days on Sunday. There's about 50 homes open around Perth. Um, you can go in um, and have a look at them. Um, jump on the website, register, or you can register at the homes. Uh, we're running a bus, a couple of bus buses, and we're taking around. I'm running a master class on each bus, split first and other. No, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. Um, but they're full, the bus, the bus tours. Uh, but it's, you can have a look at homes that you will relate to. Um, so, so <coughs> if you go to the site sustainablehouseday.com. And the website's on the yeah. bottom there. For and you, you just put in WA or Perth, and it'll tell you all the locations of the homes that are open and the times. And um, yeah, as Griff said, just travel along. Yeah. So, questions? Um, yes. If you're living in a rental and, and it's uh, like an uh, unhealthy rental, um, how can we you know, move beyond the fuel poverty issues of homes that don't have? Sunlight and yeah. heating and cooling is crap. Probably get another rental. Um, no. <laughs> um, so if it's unhealthy, you mean like it's mould and mildew or it's no, stale no, air? No, no, no sunlight. Yeah, I can't. Yeah, yeah. We need sunlight, you know, really. We're basically, we came from lizards. So we need that sunlight. <laughs> so go out and throw yourself on a rock. <laughs> um, so, uh, look, it's hard to say without the specific house. Um, if we had connected, sometimes what I do when I give public, I give a lot of public talks, etc. And I've been like, teaching for about 20 years, but I've stopped teaching now. I just give public talks. Um, teaching didn't work. Uh, well, I mean, I taught a lot of people, but the um, interesting thing is, which sort of relates back to this, but relates to everybody who's built, building a new home. Who's heard of the six star process, the star rating process for houses? Yeah. So the star rating process is really not going to tell you much. It's a compliance tool. Over 90% of the homes that are built and assessed under that rating system are just pure compliance. So you can get an 8-star home and a 6-star home could outperform it by twice. So the 6-star the home could use um, you know, half the energy of the 8-star. Uh, there's a whole lot of reasons for that. The model was based on eradicating what? Well, not eradicating, starting to get rid of worst practice. It wasn't designed as a best practice tool, first up, that's the first thing to understand. Second thing, it was designed as a, a tool um, for assessing conditioned spaces. A conditioned space is a space that's mechanically heated and cooled, like this space. So that's the assumption. So therefore, with that assumption, the model, is a, it, um, the model operates a particular way. Um, also, it does have a thermal component for, in theory, a certain amount of passive um, design, but it's really, really, really dumbed down. 
um, and also then you have the users. And if you have people um, to rate a home, realistically takes about four hundred to five hundred dollars to rate it properly using certain um, certain of those tools by a really good rater. Um, but the rate is most builders, if they have a rating done, there's a certain other another model that they can use, which is even you know, more cheeky and easy to cheat. But they will pay $120 to certain companies to get a rating. And so therefore the rating is just get it across the line, get it six star, I don't care what it's like. So therefore be very wary about thinking that it's not a six star hotel, mm -hmm. this is not a hotel in Dubai. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get an eight star home and it still could be a bit dodgy. So really do your research. Um, one of the best websites, I, I picked up a brochure there, it's got some really great websites on it. A government website, federal government, your home. Um, and it's fantastic. I was involved on, on the technical advisory committee that reassessed it when it was redone a few years ago. Um, it's a really, really, really uh, good website. It's got a fantastic site. So. I've got a copy of the book. I've got the book. I've got the book. Oh, it's a good book. Yeah, you can buy the book. Um, you can get it on the website, but you can buy the book. I think it's, they do it fairly cost effective. It's quite a it's thick a book. Yeah, I thought it was just a fancy pamphlet, but it's warm heat. Yeah, yeah, it is a thick. <laughs> and that's just the technical manual of the book. The website's even deeper than the book. It's got a lot more information on it. But the book's a good handy book, but you don't have to buy it, just jump on the web. Take another question? Yes. Yeah. Question? Straw, straw bars. Straw bars. Yeah. Straw bars. Termites are that affected? No. There's no nutrients for termites. They can live in it if you don't protect it, but they won't eat it. <laughs> um, there's no, they, they don't have the nutrients in there. So therefore, with termites, they need certain nutrients. And so um, with that, use cellulose that's, yeah, but they will live in it if they can get in there, but they won't eat it. If you then, because most straw bale is, um, is a, a structure that they do infill construction, so they build the structure. Um, some, and a lot of those structures built out of timber because people try and be more environmental because timber is more environmental. So the white ants will live in there and they eat the timber. Yeah, that's what I, that's what <laughs> but what that's what they eat. Yeah, 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 but you just you build it out of steel. Steel, put steel framing yeah, in. Steel framing, and that's what we've done. We've yeah. done a lot of straw bar. There's one open on the weekend um, in Vic Park at a uh, thing that's called Green Swing. It's a, it's a two story, 10 star straw bar house. And there's three houses on the lot, a 800 square meter lot in um, Is that the green Lathline. Swing? Green Swing. Green Swing, yeah, uh, in Lathline. And uh, there's two other houses there. I think the straw bales open. I don't know if the others are open, but there's a reverse veneer, isolated mass construction, two story, and another one with two units, um, etc. So, yeah, good question. Any other questions? Yes. Um, the uh, in retrofitting an existing house, how, what's your opinion of uh, double glazing? Um, it depends. See, double glazing is one of those things. It's um, um, when um, double glazing starts here and ends up here. Double glazing just two sheets of glass with air between them. It's really not worth getting out of bed. You need to get up here somewhere. There's a whole range. So then you go double glazing with argon, but you've still got say an A1 frame, an aluminium frame, and so instead of and you still get everything transferring through the frame. You go up to a thermally broken frame, you can get UPVC ones, uh, but environmentally UPVC, the dioxins in the pr production of PVC is very nasty. You can go to timber, um, timber frames. Timber is isolated frame because you, know, you don't get much transfer. A little bit, you still get some transfer, not much. You can get timber, aluminium with gaskets between them, then you get up to really fancy aluminium ones with gaskets between it, um, double glaze with argon, krypton, they use krypton, that's where krypton, you know, Superman can't get through the window. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, well, you'd be worried, isn't it, a bloke, you know, wearing his undies on outside of his jammies, <laughs> not down the window. <laughs> I'd be worried. Anyhow, so, um, so yes, you can go right up to get that, but most of the time, if you have a good drape and a pelmet, we build, like our new, all the new homes we do, we build the pelmet into the ceiling. And so you have a drape, a double drape. Air is one of the best insiders, trapped air, still air. That's why we wear clothes, well, to look good as well, well, some of us. So uh, what happens is that um, you trap air, 
if you look at double uh, double brick wall, the interesting thing about double brick, I'll use glass actually. There's a sheet of glass, um, five mil, typical um, piece of glass. It has an R value. R stands for resistance to heat transfer. They use R and U values, but I'll just use the R. U is the inverse, but I won't go through that. But the R value of a 5 mil piece of glass, which most of you will have in your homes and most of the windows, is 0.16. Now, it's, that's really, really, really bad, by the way. Your minimum for your wall should be around 2, 2.5. That's 0.16. So the weakest part of your house is the glazing. So, but if the air trapped on the surface of that glass, that gives it 0.16. If I took the air off the surface, it goes to 0 0.016, just by taking the air off the surface. If I have a double brick wall, there's the bricks, uh, wall ties, a few dags. So that has an R value of 0.7, double brick, no insulation, double brick, which most homes. And they're doing homes that still get six or seven stars with no insulation in the walls. I figured out around how to do it. So really, you crazy. It's like living in a crock pot, you know, really. So not a good look. Might as well jump in the bath, bit of olive oil. And <laughs> so if you took the air off the surface of that breed, you go to 0.4. So again, you know, very, very poor performer. So rammed earth is the same as double brick, by the way. That's why on that you saw them put insulation in the wall. Um, if you use rammed earth, it's a very poor material for insulation. Uh, so therefore, and you've got to be very careful when you use heavyweight materials like rammed earth because most of the walls are between four and 600 thick, depending on what they're doing. And so therefore, how you heat that up from a passive solar point with the sun coming in because you saw the windows and the sun you know, in theory, coming in. You don't get the direct sun on walls, generally, just a tiny bit. You get indirect sun a long way away. Maybe I'll do a diagram about that. <laughs> Is there a diagram about that? Sure. Yeah, okay. So, a very quick diagram on passive solar from that point of view. There's your roof, there's your window. It's north that way. Okay, ceiling, bit of black insulation in the ceiling. We've got a slab down here. There's a couple of things that I would say in there that I wouldn't do would they did this, a brick wall inside. So in winter, your sun is about 35 degrees, its lowest point, it's coming down like this end of the house. You've got short wavelength radiation coming in, hitting the floor. You should have the glass down to the slab, down to the edge on the north side. Not on those windows. A lot of those windows were up here. And he was saying the sun's hitting the floor. Well, it might, a little bit. But if you have brickwork up here or stonework or cladding whatever here that's the sun you get there mm. now this bit which is connected to the outside if you don't insulate that you don't have to in Perth by the way the coldest temperature outside in winter is at ground level it's about four degrees at night so therefore this is where you lose most of your heat so therefore if you don't have this down to the ground you're just leaching so much heat out into the ground and also if the sun's not hitting that through conduction, what's called the knock-on effect. How we heat mass is uh, direct gain or indirect gain through long wavelength, which I'll talk about, and convection, hits an object or touches an object and it transfers heat by create the molecules vibrate, the knock-on effect. That's how we store energy in materials. It vibrates, you know, feel the walls. So, um, so what happens is the short wavelength comes in, heats up the floor, it's released as long wavelength. Glass, when the sun's hitting it and it's, heat, it's warm outside, is opaque to long wavelength. That's why your car's warm on a rainy day coming dump into your car, because the long wavelength radiation is trapped inside. So it bounces around, it heats up the walls, and of course you have convective heat that rises. You have layers of temperature. So therefore, with vertical mass, because you want the floor mass, and you notice those stone walls, etc. You need that vertical mass as well because you can't store a great deal in the ground because the ground is continually leaching it down. Your temperature in winter, your ground temperature under slabs probably around 19 degrees. Um, so it's pulling it downwards. So you heat up the walls and the floor and it's a combination of the walls and the floor that gives you the heat because then at night the temperature drops outside, we start losing heat, we pull our drapes across, we've got a helmet up there, 
with a double pelmet like this, um, what happens, you've got air on the surface, air in the, in the material, air on, between the two layers, air between the material, air on the other surface. So you've got these five layers of air. Remember the glass, remember the brickwork? So that's how good drapes are, the old double drapes. You want to have them touch the wall, so in other words, you have a reveal, you had a drape across here, you want it to touch the wall on both sides, because if you have a gap there, the air will just transfer around it. If you have a gap at the top, as it heats up, it goes up the top, and then it drags the cool air in like that in summer, and heats up the whole house, if you did that, when you're pulling up the drapes on hot days, because you use them in summer and winter. When you have um, drapes closed at night, if you have gaps, then of course you're losing it. You're losing the heat out through those gaps. The good thing about a well-designed passive solar home is that it doesn't care. It goes, a little bit of leakage, big deal. I've got plenty of heat. So if you design it correctly, it means you don't have to go worrying about pulling with the exact at the same time and all that sort of stuff. Because what happens is the heat is stored in the mass. And when the temperature goes down there, the temperature um, goes down here and then it goes out through the glass, it'll leach out through other areas. When that goes down in here, because it doesn't have its heat source anymore, as soon as the temperature in the room meets the temperature of the wall, because it'll be warmer in here than the walls, and you're trying to get the walls up to about 22, 23 degrees. And so therefore through the day in a good passive solar home, on a day where it's about 15 degrees, the house will be about 25 degrees in the living areas. Yeah, we'll because of that more long way. We'll take a couple more questions, questions Griff. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Right. I'll get There's it. A couple more After questions. the time, I'll build your watch. So, uh, Griff, to summarise then, back to, say, retrofitting a home and yes. the value of, say, double glazing your windows, would you say that good quality drapes and a helmet would actually be more...? It depends on the circumstances. Okay. See, what happens is if you are going to condition the space. So all the things, I'll put those things together now. <coughs> because they're all part of, answer, sorry, I'm giving you the complete answer. My trap is that I want you to know the whole thing, not part of it. Um, so what happens is that if you can get some sun in onto mass, or then use long wavelength to heat up some mass, what happens, you need to stop the heat going out. If you can't do this, then you're going to go back to what I was talking about, conditioned spaces. So when you condition a space, which means you use a heating or a cooling system, double glazing comes into its own. Drapes will still work, but double glazing is good where you're trying to keep convective heat or convective cool in a building. That's why commercial buildings. Double glazing is not good to keep radiant heat out. Radiant heat in summer will still get in through, you put your hand on a, a double glazed window you know, in a city building and see you know, the heat that's coming through those windows. So therefore, it depends on whether or not you can get all the other things functioning um, and whether or not you want to see some people, like I was at a house today in West Leeville, West Leeville. No, there's a, from today, tonight, on a, on tomorrow night or Friday night, you'll see that house. It's double glazed and I told him, it's all double glazed in the living area and I said, look, you're going to need drapes. And he goes, no, 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 I've done all the figures. Oh, no. Anyhow, um, they've been in the house 14 months now. And he goes, and I lent him my thermal imaging camera, three and a half grand, and he, he's had it about three times, and I've told him what's going to happen. He goes, how come it's happening? I said, well, I told you so. So, and now they're going to put drapes in. So the double glazing is not giving, it, they're happy. They haven't used the heater right through winter. But I told him you can get two more degrees if you put drapes in. Two more degrees at night. This is not through the day, but at night you get two more degrees. You get two more degrees downstairs, and probably upstairs he might get two and a half, three degrees upstairs, just by putting drapes in. Um, so, so it's it's hard to say. You have to go to high end double glazing if you want to get good performance. Um, but if you put in double drapes in, and you can, you've got this, an area where you can actually store heat from the sun, then you may not bother about double glazing, and the drapes might be enough. The good thing about mass is that if you have a bit of leakage through drapes, it doesn't bother it because the mass keeps on giving it out if you've got enough mass in the right place. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. yes. Down the back. Yeah, so say if you leave for work at um, 
just before lunch or something, and then you come back maybe at seven o'clock at night. Do you close the curtains before you leave? No, no, just no. leave them open. Okay, yeah, leave no. them open. It, it, it doesn't matter because again, the same thing. If you have enough mass, in other words, it depends on the design of the building, obviously. If you've got a passive solar home, it's not going to make much difference at all. You'll lose a bit of heat out through the glass, but it stores so much heat that basically that's consistent. It's not like, oh, up and down. It's, it's very slow moving in the curve. Up and down goes, uh, outside goes up and down. So therefore, if your home is storing the heat from the sun with the design of the building, you could leave the drapes, you wouldn't close them. If your house is a poorly designed home and you can't store the heat from the day from the sun, then you probably close them. Um, so, but, so it depends which way the room's facing, which room it is, does the sun hit the floor, um, how much volume of air, how much mass is there, and all that sort of stuff. Is the mass covered? You know, some rooms might have a lot of mass in there, but it's covered by things. So therefore, you may not be able to use the mass in the same way. Let's take one more question. Yes? Hi. Um, we're in an apartment, three-level apartment, three units, and um, it turns out by accident we've been there for so long and raised children and a dog and everything. We never use heaters or air conditioning, so it's worked well enough to keep the small, the compact living box. Yes. But with 32 owners, and it's about 40 years old, we can't really persuade that many people on what to do, so we're retrofitting some green options, which... I can see we need to do even things like if someone gets an electric car or any points in the car parks and things like that. Mm. Is there a consultancy group or who do you talk to without having to go to all the different people and work out which is the best bang for our buck as a body corporate to start moving? There's, look, there's not too many people um, no. doing it because what happened when Green when the six star came in, um, because it was all basically in theory it was cranked up, but it was dumbed down. As a consequence, um, people weren't, uh, there, there was very, a lot of people who just went out of the industry, went to Eastern States, got sacked out of government. The government just drained out everybody. That, and so therefore there was no support structure and there wasn't much interest. The building industry itself, I sit on committees in the HIA, I sat on committees in the MBA, I sit on the Disability Services Commission, trying to change things. So, um, and it just got dumbed down. And that's one of the reasons I stopped teaching. So, look, I don't know anybody that does it like that. I used to, but I don't. I'm sort of too busy. Um, so, doing what I do. Um, and you've got to put a whole lot of things together, and it depends, particularly if you're doing a, a series of, like, say, 30 something apartments. We've got 32 apartments, and we probably only do one or two jobs at a time if yeah. I could even persuade yeah. people to do that. But you really need someone. I can't. Yeah, look, the, the basics are the same. You know, if you look at it, the first thing you do, um, you look at the envelope of the building. So you deal with the envelope of the building, which means if it's double brick, you can insulate it. There's a company, AWS, um, insulate it straight away. Uh, uh, depending on the orientation, uh, where the insulation... Uh, but uh, Australian insulation services, they just drill holes and pump it in, cover the holes up, you'll hardly see them um, in brickwork. Um, look at the roof, you know, your ceilings, um, if you've got tile roofs and it's three storey, I'd change it to a metal roof, you know. The tiles hold the heat and re-radiate the heat. Again, you've got a big oven. Um, insulate underneath the roof as well as the ceiling. Um, if you've got tiles in a house you don't want to, what you can do is get someone who's very small and very agile up there and you can staple a particular type of insulation to the rafters underneath the tiles and that will make a massive difference just by doing that. And then insulate the ceilings. Um, you then go to the windows, which is part of your envelope, so you work on the windows. So it's a system, you work yeah. through it. If people try and tell you you need to buy all this different equipment, etc., generally that's not the case. You look at smart design first. Design is the thing like, um, you know, you have a really nice smart suit, whether it's a woman's suit or a male suit. If it's well designed, it'll last, and you use it with different things. Over a long period of time, it'll hardly change. <coughs> Poorly designed, it'll be out of date in five years or a year. You know, so design is the first thing. Understand the physics of it. So you work on the envelope, then you work inwards. Um, then, once you've worked inwards, on the appliances, etc., on the heating system, you know, the efficiency of that, then what happens, you work outwards again. 
you go out on the outside and look at your mechanical systems, which means um, your hot water system, even though it uses the most, you've got to do the building first, then your hot water systems. Like the evacuator tubes that they have on there, they're, they're here, you can use those, use solar systems, depending on the different units, how they're structured, because hot water is a killer. Um, and then you can go to your PV panels. And then, because once you've done that, you'll know how much energy has been used. That's when you decide how much PV panels you put on. You don't just, the photovoltaics producing electricity, you don't just plonk them on. And you need someone who knows what they're doing because they'll put them in all sorts of different directions. A lot of people think you're doing that first. No, 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 no. No, it's the last thing. Uh, it's, it, and it's, yeah, it's. I was just going to say, you want to reduce your energy consumption by insulating everything and then getting panels appropriate to what your energy needs are. Do you see? It's hard to get the motivation when you've got lots of different people because they all get their the, own the biggest goals. motivation is yeah. this. If you can tell people that, if you can give them a cost analysis of what it's going to cost them over the long term, yeah. how much they're going to save by doing all these things, yeah. then they'll do it. Everything comes down. People understand this. doesn't matter what language I speak, they understand. And my suggestion is, you said earlier on, do one, do one at a time. I don't one at a time. I'd choose one. Choose one, do it. It's a test bit. People go, well, okay, you know, and um, uh, because some of it will be part of the um, of the body corporate, and others might be inside the building is probably personal. So look at someone's prepared to do it, and do a cost benefit analysis on that one, and then you can say to people, well, look, you know, look at what we're saving. Look at how this is working, and you can go from there. Obviously, it's if it's the roof. You can't do much, but if you've got a tile roof and you don't want to place it, as I say, insulate underneath it. There's a particular insulation that you can get to put underneath it. Um, that uh, it's like it's foam and it's two layers of foil as well. It's very, very robust, and you just staple with a furniture stapler to the rafters, and that will give you 95% radiant protection of heat coming through the roof. Just that, and it's only eight mil thick. Wow. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, it's a simple. It's things like that, really simple, and um, yeah, no charge. <laughs> <laughs> Can we please thank Griff. Questions? I'll hang around to ask, answer questions. Can I ask one uh, last question, please? Yeah. Very quickly. Quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I met one old man, Italian man, that he built a few years ago a house with the underground, uh, what we call a cantina, we call a cellar, a cellar yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that is, a, I would say, I would consider it like a typical example that is a underground uh, living area, yeah. is very stable, very stable for yeah. temperature, yeah. so why mm, yeah. nobody does it's, it? It's too expensive. Um, it's too expensive? Yeah, yeah. From, from the point of view, if you do it yourself, um, uh, look, you can get very stable temperatures in the ground. Like around Australia, especially in hot climates, yeah. um, up north, etc., it's really great. Yeah. Um, so, or down south, where it's very cold, you get very stable temperatures. But it's expensive, and you've got to tank the walls, you've got to seal them. Um, you know, under the BCAs, you've got all sorts of conditions to meet. So, if let's say if you built a garage at ground level, because mm. this is typically we have a lot of people who want to build garages underground because of the space, we don't have much space. So, therefore, if you build a garage above ground and you put it underground, just a normal garage, you know, which is 36 square meters, mm. maybe a bit more, that will cost you another $50,000 <gasps> to put the garage underground. So therefore, you put a house underground, you can imagine the cost. Yeah. I mean, it's just the way it works I'm out. Sure it could be. Hmm? I'm sure it could be. In Cooper, you, you, you want to do it there for sure. But yeah, so it's a good idea, I agree. Um, and it's very stable, but expensive. If you do it yourself, um, yes, you're worthwhile. Well, let's say, for example, calculate a 30 years uh, life of the house, which is quite acceptable, it's yeah. not very long. I saw some houses that are even uh, 80 years old yeah. now. Uh, but, so it's not worth it? It's still um, not worth look, it? Look, again, it's a social thing as well. As human beings, um, we, we, we don't live in, like living underground, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so there's a, there's this you know sense you know it's mm -hmm. like the walls are going to cave in on me etc. So a lot of people there's that side of it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore, yes, it's a worthwhile thing I think. But again, it's only for a few people. Good mm -hmm. idea, 
but you won't get it in the general population. They won't take it up, even if they think it's a good idea. How many good ideas do you know that you don't use? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, it's like that. You know, like, yeah. uh, thank you, Andre. Thank Can we you. Please thank Griff Morris. Thank you.